It's a lunch to the homeless population in Denver, right outside of Denver City Hall. They have asked if it might be possible for our group to bring not only the meal to share that day, but also socks that can be handed out to the homeless population in Denver. So we have received a very generous offer from a member of this congregation that they are willing to match the first $500 raised for socks so that we can take up to $1,000 worth of socks to Denver um, with us on our little plane as we go this coming week. But if you would like to make a donation to After Hours Denver to our sock funds so that we can help the homeless population in the urban area of Denver, um, please uh, put a check with a note on it in the offering plate or email Kelly uh, uh, Wagner about that and we'll get that donation to Denver when we go. Um, speaking of fundraisers, uh, ASP, the Appalachian Service Project, we're taking an adult trip there this fall, and the Rao has actually created a fundraiser for our ASP trip. Now, some of you know about this already, but anyone who buys tickets to their current show, Ring of Fire, um, and uses the special code ASP18, so Appalachian Service Project 18, will donate $7 automatically to our adult work tour that's going to the Appalachian Service Project this year. So if you're a Johnny Cash fan, if you're a fan of the theater, if you're a fan of service, this is a great way for you to get involved, and we hope that you will go see the show and support our church at the same time. Finally, um, just a note that there are still some free tomato plants in the fellowship hall. These were donated by one of our congregation members a few weeks ago, and they still need a good home and a place to be planted. So if you like fresh tomatoes, please take some home today. Um, with that, friends, knowing that there is much going on in this congregation, much happening in our own lives, we come now to the time when we are invited to give to God to give to God from our treasure, to give to God from our talents. In this time of offering, as you consider what you might give, may we all give joyfully and with glad hearts.
Beloved, we are privileged not only to bring our gifts and return them to God, but all that we are, all that rests in our hearts, and to offer them before God in prayer, those joys, those concerns, some of which I would like to raise with you at this time, exciting joys and some concerns, beginning with our own congregation here um, this last uh, week. Um, Ed Gorka, beloved member of uh, the congregation, uh, passed away this last week. Asked for your prayers for Carleth. We have been keeping Ed in our prayers for some time, uh, but he passed peacefully at home. Services will be this upcoming Saturday. Uh, and thank you for your prayers and comfort as it surrounds Carleth and their family during this difficult time. We give thanks to God for Vacation Bible School this last week. Um, I know that uh, my son Sam, who is up here helping me lead the hymn sing just a moment ago, and so many other, we had over 30 kids that were here, and so many volunteers. If you helped out this last week at Vacation Bible School, uh, can you just raise your hand? Can you all say that is amen? Amen. Thank you for that. It was awesome, uh, Vacation Bible School. My favorite part was that um, when Nina and I were first married, uh, she I'm a morning person, she is not, and I like to start the day with rise and shine and give God the glory, glory, which she is not a fan of that song at all, as I would sing that early in the mornings. But every day of Vacation Bible School they did, and so when we uh, had the great concert uh, for the Vacation Bible School concert on Wednesday night, they started with that, and it just made my evening, so thank you for that. Give thanks to God. We also have some other really exciting things. There was news that came out, a labor report this last week, that right now the fewest number of people earning a wage below the poverty line has happened this last week. So that means the fewest people. This is the lowest uh, percentage of people that are earning below the poverty line. Now, friends, we know that we are a long way from the kingdom, but the fact that poverty has dipped down so low within this country so far is an incredible thing, and for that we give thanks. We also give thanks that, as you know, that we are called to be stewards not only of our resources but of the earth this last week. Uh, Starbucks Coffee announced that it is getting rid of straws by the year 2020, which is good news, amen? <laughs> amen, amen. But friends, we also know that there, just as there are exciting things that are happening in our midst, there are also troubling things. Sometimes they are too weighty and we don't know what to do with them. And so once again, I ask you to join me in prayers as we lift up our brothers and sisters in Chicago this last weekend where there was uh, another shooting and there was violence between police and civilians and incredible uh, fear and anger and outrage. And so I ask that you would join me in prayer, in prayer for the, the police officers, in prayer for the family of uh, the individual who was shot, and in prayer for all of those who are feeling hopeless during this time of racial and socioeconomic division. Uh, please, we need to keep um, our uh, extended family in Chicago in our prayers. Beloved, what joys and concerns do you have to bring before the congregation today? Yeah, of course. We're going to bring you a microphone right on over. George is going to be 85 next week, and his son, Kevin, is here from Dallas, Texas, with his friend, Dwayne. Amen. Amen. Welcome. Uh, you may have noticed that Linda Thorson's name is on the prayer list. Um, she did have an appendectomy, uh, but it had ruptured, and a part of her colon was kind of snatched out of her in the process of the surgery. So although that surgery was Thursday morning, she's still hospitalized, and I think she needs everybody's prayers. Thank you, Eva. Good morning, I'm Dwayne Lottie, and my wife, Lenore, I had asked for prayers for her trip to Kenya, and uh, just to let you know that she got there safely, and um, that she's actually, as Pastor Eric just mentioned, she's with a group of individuals that are 
focused on conservation on a worldly basis, and sometimes we take for granted how easily things come to us here in the United States. And, uh, but again, just pray for them and the work that they're doing um, as they look to explore that further. And she just wanted to pass on that this morning. She had an opportunity. Well, that was so morning for her right now. It's actually almost, almost 6 o'clock in the evening there, but the, early this morning uh, she went on a drive and encountered a mother lioness with five um, yearling cubs that were with her. Something that's completely rare, but just, again, the handiwork of God's creation. So thank you again for all your prayers. Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> that's just crazy. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's awesome, but also crazy. Anybody else lying with cubs on the way to church? No? <laughs> just check in. You never know. Well, beloved, let us bring all of these joys, all of these concerns, those spoken aloud, those that rest in our hearts. And I invite you now to join me in a time of silence. This is a time when we not only lift up any of those prayers that remain in our heart before God, but also I invite you to join me in listening to what God is saying to you at this time. Where is God calling you, comforting you, challenging you, pushing you, and holding you close? Beloved, let us join in prayer. ever-present God, wherever life's journey leads us, whether it is on the mountaintops of celebrations, of those glimpses, those moments when we can see your kingdom so brilliantly, so beautifully, those moments when we are truly inspired and hope thrives and we know beyond hope that peace is possible, that your kingdom is coming, that it will be done on earth as it surely is in heaven. And there we can feel you beside us, lifting us up, giving us the strength beneath our feet. And God, you are also with us as we come down that mountain. As life leads us into the deep valleys of life, into times of pain and distress, of heartbreak and worry, into systemic issues of poverty and racism and the destruction of your creation, things that seem so insurmountable that we cannot even begin to see a way out of the darkness, and yet there you are a light unto our path, and a way through the wilderness, and all the other places, the in-betweens, the times when we fall into routine, and too often, God, are blinded by your beauty, your majesty, your creation unfolding around us, surprising us, inspiring us. So this day, God, assure us once more of your presence as it holds us close here in this place, as we celebrate the ways in which it moves, not just at this moment, but throughout this week in vacation Bible school, as it has moved through our members, as it holds those who celebrate 85th birthdays and those who still await healing and wholeness within their hospital rooms. May it reach out far, 
far beyond these walls into our community, helping those who are hurting most. May it reach beyond our nation into the streets of Chicago, where even as we pray, there are those who gather in anger, outrage, frustration, and fear. May it reach beyond Chicago through our nation to the corridors of power so that it may transform this nation through your grace. Forgiveness and patience may it even reach beyond the seas to hold our sister Lenore fast as she as she is awakened to your beauty by seeing your creation and motherhood and the playing of cub children. God, you inspire us, you take the broken parts of our hearts and you make them whole. You give us hope to get up and move, to share your love, to share your grace, to believe once more that the news is good. And so be with us in this moment, at this time, and in the days to come. Be that wind lifting up our wings and carrying us evermore to speak your good news, your love, your grace, in a world that is in hurting and in desperate need of that word of compassion. In the name of your Son, we pray. Amen. Hi, I'm uh, Davis Lake. Um, the song I'll be singing today is called Bright Eyes, or Bowl of Oranges by Bright Eyes. Um, the song isn't um, outwardly religious, but I think the lyrics kind of speak for themselves in some of the Christian values that we can all agree upon. The rain had started tapping on the window near my bed. There was a loophole in my dreaming, so I got out of it. And to my surprise, my eyes were wide and already open. Just my nightstand and my dresser Where those nightmares had just been So I dressed myself and left them Out into the grey street But everything seemed different And completely new to me The sky, the trees, houses, buildings Even my own body And each person I encountered I couldn't wait to meet And I came upon a doctor Who appeared in quite poor health Said there's nothing that I can do for you, you can't do for yourself He said, oh yes you can, just hold my hand I think that that would help So I sat with him a while, then I asked him how he felt He said, I think I'm cured In fact, I'm sure of it Thank you, stranger For your therapeutic smile so that's how I learned the lesson that everyone's alone And your eyes must do some raining if you're ever gonna grow And when crying don't help, you can't compose yourself It's best to compose a poem An honest verse of longing or a simple song of hope That's why I'm singing, baby, don't worry, cause now I got your back And every time you feel like crying, I'ma try to make you laugh if I can't, if it just hurts too bad, then we'll wait for it to pass. And I will keep you company for those days so long in black. We'll keep working on the problems we know we'll never solve. Our loves and even remainders, our lives are fractions of a whole. But if the world could remain within a frame, like a painting on a wall, then I'd think we'd see the beauty then, and stand staring in awe. At our still lives post Like a bowl of oranges Like a story told By the fault lines And the soil Thank you.
scripture reading today is from Psalm 37. I'll be reading the first 11 verses and then the final six verses. It's a very long psalm. And see if you can hear the difference when I start at verse 35 at the end in the language. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of the wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him, and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the delight, and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord, and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek shall inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. And from verse 35, I have seen the wicked oppressing and towering like a cedar of Lebanon. Again I passed by, and they were no more. Though I sought them, they could not be found. Mark the blameless, and behold the upright, for there is posterity for the peaceable. But transgressors shall be altogether destroyed. The posterity of the wicked shall be cut off. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their refuge in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. The word of God for the people of God. So a week ago this morning, I was about an hour southeast of here in the town of Elmhurst, Illinois, and I was surrounded by roughly 300 teens and tweens. I know that sounds like fun to all of you. Now, eight of them were from our church. They were familiar faces, but the other 290 or so were brand new. These were kids who had gathered from across Illinois and Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, and Kentucky. Each of them was engaged in their own youth ministry programs at their own United Church of Christ congregation. And just as you all were, I'm sure, really hitting your stride over at the Lakeside Festival, these 300 students converged not far away on the Elmhurst College campus to attend a once every four year occasion dubiously titled the Great Lakes Regional Youth Event. Now, if you've never heard of this event before, that's not surprising. The youth events in our denomination that we put on here are fairly well-kept secrets outside of the immediate student ministry world. We in this church, for instance, know all about our work tours. Our high schoolers depart for their next one on Friday this week, actually, because July is a busy month. But youth events are more foreign around here. So let me try to explain briefly. A youth event in the context of the United Church of Christ is a gathering of students that's based not on shared hours of volunteerism, but around shared faith and shared witness and a shared desire to learn more. So what that means is that for four days, we in the United Church of Christ in this area gathered 300 teens together to dive deep into worship and learning and a little bit of service. And specifically, we gathered them together to share amongst our community a message of hope. Now, 18 months ago, 
I was honored with the invitation to chair the planning committee for this event. Whether you've realized it or not, I've actually been on loan in ministry to the wider Great Lakes region of the UCC for some time. And I can still remember being on an early tour of the Elmhurst College campus with my assembled planning team. When we were walking through the college chapel, talking about small, tiny detail things. What kind of AV equipment would we have when we were in that space? Where would the band set up their drums and place their guitar? We were stuck in that kind of tedium when all of a sudden one of the committee members blurted out in the middle of our conversation, hey, isn't the last day of our event July 8th? Yes, we agreed collectively, a little annoyed that this guy didn't yet know the dates of our event. Yes, we would have our closing worship with the students who joined us on Sunday morning, July 8th. Get with the program, come on. At which point, this member of the planning committee pointed to this bronze plaque that hangs in the narthex of the Elmhurst College Chapel and said, do you have any idea who else was here on July 8th? When we gather with the teams around that table, when they're seated in those pews in front of that pulpit, it will be 52 years to the day since Martin Luther King Jr. spoke here. Now those of you who know your civil rights history know that 1966 was a year of incredible involvement in Chicago from the Reverend Dr. King. He was deeply engaged at that time in this audacious struggle for open housing in the city. And as a result, he was in town often, speaking more and more loudly against racial hatred and seeking real justice for the poor downtown. And it was this whirlwind summer especially because there was a civil rights rally planned at Soldier Field in mid-July and a nonviolent march through the southwest side's Marquette Park set for August of that year. And so knowing the story as I do now, I wonder if it may have been a surprise to Dr. King when amidst all of that, this ad hoc committee of West suburban residents called him up and asked if he might come out to speak in the quiet, leafy suburban town of Elmhurst. You can imagine the conversation just a little bit. Please, they must have said, please. We know that you're busy and deeply engaged in the city, but please come out here and share about the Chicago Freedom Movement. We'll give you a chapel at our college. The pulpit is yours. There are some communities out here that are a little more isolated from what you're doing. And we would like you to come teach about what's happening across the country and especially downtown. Whether he was actually surprised or not, Dr. King agreed to this speaking engagement. And in a chapel built for 800 people, he spoke to 1,200 that day. They stood shoulder to shoulder in every nook and cranny and corner and aisle of that chapel. From, and um, Dr. King stood in the very pulpit that I myself stood behind just last week on the very same date. On that July 8th, Dr. King delivered a message of God's promised good. And there's this one particularly powerful line of that speech that's quoted now on the plaque that hangs in that chapel. It goes like this. With this faith, Dr. King said, with this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. Now that was a sentiment and a story that was too good not to share with the teens who were gathered in that chapel last Sunday, so we did share it. And in fact, we based our entire closing worship around that moment and that line. And a week later, I find that it's too good of a story not to share with all of you, so here it is again. With this faith. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. That's a beautiful assurance, is it not? 
I've mulled these words over quite a few times since our planning team first noticed that plaque in the college chapel, and quite a few more times since being in that space on that anniversary just last week. Those words contain within them the kind of idea, the kind of promise that we read or hear and we really want to believe in. And yet, it's also true that those words are the kind that, depending on your headspace or your heart space when you encounter them, well, they may elicit less of a yes and more of a yeah, right. Don't I wish? Wouldn't that be nice in our dreams? Even now, as I repeat the words to you, I'm aware that they contain these impossible proportions and accomplishments. I mean, really, who could ever expect to hew an entire mountain into a stone? It sounds so crazy and so impossible and so foolishly hopeful that this idea is perhaps not far removed from what we read in our psalm today. Psalm 37, which makes this absurd promise that the days of the wicked among us are numbered and that it's just a matter of time before the good people on this earth receive not only justice, but indeed every last desire of their hearts. Now that's a beautiful assurance. As Dan read the words, I wanted to believe them, I want to believe them. But given the state of things, when we look around. Now, as far as biblical scholars can tell, looking around is exactly how this psalm got started. I say as far as scholars can tell because when it comes to the psalms, guesswork is often the best that anyone is really able to do. The book of Psalms we know is like a hymn book. It's a mixtape as this sermon series calls it. It's a collection of wisdom that's being drawn from multiple people, delivered in bits and pieces, and gathered over a long period of time. There's not necessarily a central narrative that drives this collection, at least not with a cool primary character like Moses or Lydia or Abraham. Instead, the Psalms offer up the story of Israel in fragments. So this book, this collection of writings, it offers up the struggle for hope experienced by Israel in a deeply moving and meaningful way, but it's all told in bits and pieces. Now you may have noticed this in our preaching series this summer. Even the deep cuts, even the psalms we know by heart, don't necessarily flow directly into or out of the pieces that have surrounded them from week to week. Here in worship in this sanctuary, we'll tune in one Sunday to hear a particular psalmist offer up praise and nothing but praise for the awesome works of God. And then we'll arrive the next week ready for more of that feeling, only to encounter the deepest expression of despair that we have ever known. In some ways, this can be a pesky way to do worship. It can be a pesky way to do preaching. We're bouncing around in emotion so much from week to week that we risk exhausting ourselves. And indeed, this might be an unbearable way to go through a summer if it weren't for this fact. That this is the same way we sense and experience our own human living. I mean, the entire Exodus story is grand and sweeping and majestic and a fun thing to tune into, but grand and sweeping is not the way that I encounter my life. Life comes to us in bits and pieces. Just walking around in the world, we trip on peace and then on pain, and we bump our shins on gifts and then on wounds, and we do so not necessarily with any sense that there's a great order or some plan. And if you don't believe me, think back to our community prayer time just a few moments ago in this service. Think back to those same moments in different services, to prayers that you have lifted in this sanctuary. How often our personal tales of stasis told right next to stories of well-being? How often are we plunged into collective dismay by one story, only to be surprised in the very next instant 
by someone sharing a deep joy. It all mixes in this place. It mixes here every time we gather. We bring those varied experiences and expressions with us so that together, amidst all that we see, we can search for God. I wonder if maybe that's what the gathered community was doing all those ages ago when the composer of this psalm began to speak. Maybe they were together in a sanctuary, in a synagogue, in a chapel. Maybe they were out somewhere in creation, observing as much of the world as their eyes would see. Maybe they were sharing joys and concerns and spreading stories. I don't know if it happened directly, but someone in that space must have asked a question or wondered if hope was worth having or shared a doubt. Something must have stirred in the community, though, because from somewhere amongst that crowd emerged this soft and steady assurance. Don't fret because of the wicked, one of them said. Don't be envious of wrongdoers, because they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Now, I love the way that one sounds just as much as I love Dr. King's stone hewn from a mountain. But the trouble is, we live in an age and a culture that doesn't much believe that this promise is really assured. These days, it seems we are deeply suspicious, and with good cause, arguably, of any psalm or any person who confidently declares that the wicked's days are numbered. Right? We see too much wickedness to buy it. Economic equality runs rampant with trenches dug deep by the Great Recession. The environment is still being exploited day after day. Those in power, with power, are often unwilling to share it, and even more often, they're unwilling to even acknowledge that they have power at all. You can pick your talking point here. But who could ever believe that the wicked will soon fade and wither and be cut off? Who here, and who in ancient Israel? After all, ancient Israel was who this psalm was initially for. And if we have any familiarity with the Old Testament, with the Hebrew Bible whatsoever, we must know that there was in Israel plenty of national arrogance, plenty of will to power, plenty of ignorance about other nations to go around. There is no shortage of hate or fear. Israel struggled with continual attacks of hopelessness, and as a result, the ancient scriptures are full of stories and outcries about the despair of life. So sometimes, against the hard realities of Israel's histories, writings like this one can stick out like a sore thumb. They can sound overly optimistic, idealistic, ridiculous, and strange, and even foolish. Sometimes we bump up against readings like this one, and it just sounds too good to be true. It's because of that that we might toss it out entirely, this psalm, if we thought too much about it. And yet, our ancestors preserved it. And there's something to that. From every generation, from ancient Israel to this very moment, they passed it down. The great cloud of witnesses, they wanted us to have this psalm in our common language, in our common story, in our common songbook. So there must be something there. Now, I learned recently about a concept from the field of psychology. Maybe some of you know this one. It's called the anchoring effect. And it deals with this basic misunderstanding we have about ourselves and the way that we operate in the world. So here's the idea. Uh, Who here believes that you are a rational person? All right, we've got some rational people here. Yeah. We all consider ourselves to be rational people. Many of us in this room, no doubt, pride ourselves on how responsible we are when we make decisions in our lives. When it comes to determining the course of where we're going, our values, our actions, we believe that we do a pretty decent job of analyzing all the factors before we make a choice about how we're going to behave. 
Now, according to psychologists and behavioral scientists, however, the truth of the matter is entirely different. The truth is, we are anchored not by our rationality, but by our perceptions, how we perceive things in the world. And what this means is that the information we have, especially the stuff we learn early on in our lives, lingers in our minds for ages and impacts all of the decisions that we make and all of the outlooks we have as we go along. If that sounds heady and confusing, I agree with you. So to illustrate this, folks will often turn to some hypothetical situation to show you how it goes. So let's suppose, for example, that I am going to ask you all how old Mahatma Gandhi was when he died. For this half of the congregation, I'm going to come to you and I'm going to preface the question by saying, did he die before or after the age of nine? And then differently to this side of the congregation, I'm going to say, did he die before or after the age of 149? Okay. Now, neither phrasing of that question is especially helpful for giving you the answer. Right? Anyone who knows anything about Gandhi will know he was older than nine. And the oldest person who ever lived was 122. It's an astonishing age, but still far short of 149. And yet, if we were to run the experiment, which as it happens was the basis of a real study back in 1999, these initial statements would very likely affect the estimates you made for how old Gandhi was when he died. In the experiment run by the folks who pioneered this, for example, the first group asked if Gandhi was older than nine, guessed an average of 50 years at the age of death. And the second offered the initial number of 149, guessed that he was 67. Now, neither was close. He was assassinated at the age of 87. But you can still see the effect of the initial number, 50 and 67. It's substantial. When you set your sights high, you are tugged toward that altitude. Now, sometimes I wonder if that's not what the Psalms and the lofty promises of our tradition are doing. What if that's what they're there for, to set our sights high, giving us the perception that something big and amazing and wonderful is possible, and getting us that idea early so that we might stretch our arms and our hearts up a little further than we would have otherwise? Why be tied to despair and even to practicality when we might lift our perceptions and our anchor a little bit upward? What difference might it make? What difference does it make when we are taught to reach for the kingdom first? The folks who preserved the Psalms must have known that on particular days, this kind of it'll all be okay promise we find in Psalm 37 would seem impossible and foolish. But perhaps they also knew the power of placing a foolish hope in our sights in the first place. Maybe they knew that just by mentioning the possibility, we would be tugged in that direction. We would work to get a little closer. We would anger ourselves up there rather than somewhere else down the shore. Listen, the psalmist says. Listen. All of this that you're witnessing, I've watched it. I've known it. I have seen the wicked oppressing and towering like a cedar of Lebanon. I have been witness to those who would destroy us and those that would turn us against each other in fear. I have been around those who would shrink our hearts and hobble our imaginations, those who would bind our minds and slide themselves behind our eyes and curl themselves inside our ears and even infect our souls. I have seen the way that our feeling and our thinking and our seeing and our hearing and our tasting and our touching and our believing is tried. But listen. Listen here and listen good. I don't want you anchoring yourself to any of that. Instead, 
I want you to hold on to this vision that one day I passed by and the wicked were no more. I even sought them and they couldn't be found. I know and I can tell you with certainty that there is posterity for the peaceable and that God is at work in the world rescuing and saving and changing and working and bringing the kingdom. That is your anchor. So take refuge and be held steady in God. Fifty-two years and one week ago today, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. stood in a chapel not far from here and made an impossible statement. With this faith, he said, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. And now there have been many days of late when you could certainly have an argument over whether that mountain has gotten any smaller, whether our hope has been carved out any better, or if it's just getting buried again in old dust. But Dr. King believed in those words. He believed in that task and in that wisdom. And the psalmist did too. That's where they placed their anchor, and that's where they sought to anchor us, with the intention that it would tug this whole world a little closer to the kingdom that's coming. That's what they reached for throughout all of their days. Whether we can make sense of it or not, I think that hope is how we will transform the world. And if it sounds foolish, I get that. This is the moving paradox of our faith. Every day we count on things we cannot see to hold us when we fall, and we entrust the weight of our lives to things we cannot prove. By the power of our beliefs, we choose what kind of world we will live in, one that stretches and tugs us upward because the world is infused with God's goodness, or a flat world that offers nothing special and is exactly as it seems. Is hope foolish, or is it faithful? I don't know, maybe, maybe it's both. But in all of human history, it seems to have made more of a difference than anything else. So reckless or not, foolish or not, imprudent or not, hope is where I'm tying my anchor. And if you'll join me, Maybe we can hold each other steady as we go. Maybe we can tug in a divine direction. And we can pull all of creation along with us, and we can bring the kingdom closer. Maybe we can. We can. Amen.
Friends, go forth from this place surrounded and filled with the hope of God's promises. Don't let anyone ever tell you that hope can't make a difference. It's the only thing that ever has. And as you go, may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, bless you and be with you every day of your life. In Jesus Christ, amen. Amen.